So we'll begin the public comment. Uh, comments will be limited to three minutes. Please identify yourself for the record and spell your first and last names. Uh, two minutes for public comment, I apologize. And spell your first and last name. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing, so hopefully everybody can hear you. No. Now it's good. Okay. Okay, can we get the first caller, please? I can't hear you. Governor? Yep. Uh, good morning. Uh, with all due respect, I, I am not sure that the callers that are calling in for public comment are aware if they need to just uh, jump in to comment or if we need to dial star nine as indicated in the uh, call-in instructions, sir. Well... Director Daniels, do you have somebody there that's conducting this that can orchestrate this? I don't have access to these calls in minutes. Uh, hello, uh, sir. Hello, sir. Um, we'll take it from here. Um, hello uh, to everyone that has called in for the public comments portion today. Please select star nine now. Make your phone mute. When we're ready to uh, receive your calls, we'll be identifying you by the last four digits of your phone number. Please be prepared and make a note that this is being recorded. Thank you. Please have the first caller start. Okay, you're gonna have to give them the four digits so they know who should speak. Do you have the first one ready to go? Yes, caller 2209, please unmute your phone by pressing star six. Two minutes to speak. Good morning, my name is Ashley and I'm here with Return Strong Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated to address my concerns with the director's proposed changes to AR-258. I am here to express my thoughts about these changes and the impact on an incarcerated person as well as a victim of two crimes. My father was murdered and my uncle was killed instantly by an underage drunk driver. I have had my share of loss and the truth is that no amount of restitution will bring them back. There is no monetary amount that will make it less painful. There is no number of zeros that could ever replace them in my life or my children's lives. Both of the perpetrators of the crimes against the fam my family are doing life sentences. The loss of their freedom was the punishment of the crimes that they committed. I think about the people that hurt our family, and at the end of the day, I finally, I firmly believe that they still need to be treated as human beings with dignity and opportunity to have some degree of a life inside of the prison. Yes, my family is owed restitution in both cases, and it is unlikely that we will ever see that money. And at this point, the money would just feel like blood money, especially when I know how critical that money would be for the incarcerated person. Because I also have a loved one in prison, I am very aware of how critical a few dollars can be to their survival. I understand that without the money we send to my loved one that is incarcerated, he would really struggle to survive and maintain any level of basic human dignity. He would be hungry all the time because honestly, the prison does not provide adequate nutrition. He has serious health conditions that make that a necessity. He would not have money to buy minutes for the phone to be able to speak to his family. He would not be able to purchase hygiene products and the one hotel side bar of soap and a roll of toilet paper that he gets just doesn't cut it. I think about the two people that caused such devastation to our family and realize their families are going through this too. They are facing maintaining in prison. Also, their punishment is their loss of freedom, but they still need to be able to survive. The state chasing money should not make victims out of incarcerated people. We all are struggling to survive through COVID-19 and inside they are fighting for their lives. Every one of them is affected. It has affected everyone inside and outside. It affects everyone mentally, physically, and emotionally. People are chasing money instead of looking at the reality of the bigger picture of downward spiraling effects Hello, short and long term. Hello, caller. You have about 15 seconds to wrap up. Thank you.
Okay, when do we stop and look at them as human beings and have compassion? This is a really honest, destructive policy by the state that is reasonable anyway. In addition, it is my understanding that the state reached out to victim services and told them to come here today to speak in support of this bill. Truthfully, that is manipulative and disgusting. Public comments are a place for the public to freely come and speak for the state to attempt to support and ask people to come and support their policy is really horrible. Many of us are families who have an issue with this change to policy. The director's out of bounds by interfering in this matter in public comment. Please vote no the proposed changes to ARC 58. Thank you. Okay, if I could ask staff to give an email address where people can submit their written comments to, please. You want to take a minute and do that neck between the next one? Go ahead. Next caller, please. Hello, caller 5262 with the number ending in. 62, please unmute your phone by pressing star six. Your turn is now. My name is Keisha and I'm here as a member of Return Strong Families for United for Justice for the Incarcerated. I'm here to speak in regard to the concerns with Director Daniels continued disrespect to both the people he is supposed to be responsible for as well as his blatant disregard for the direction given to him by the Board of Commission. At the October 8th meeting, Director Daniels and NDOC have shown to unilaterally create and implement standards without the board's authorization and oversight and failed to take into consideration the public interest. It was previously determined that the AR-258 was to be suspended and go back to the status quo ante, to which it has not in its entirety. For example, inmate deductions have been put on hold. However, Director Daniels has not reinstated the gift coupon program. It was brought into the public comments that a change of this magnitude required many more conversations and vetting out through the true implications of Marsh's law before any action can be taken. Governor Sisolak agreed that both families of victims and families of the inmates should be afforded the opportunity to be heard. While today we would be a second opportunity for people to have a voice, in honesty, comments were ended at the October 8th meeting because there were so many people and so much chaos that only a few people were actually able to speak. Today is now the second opportunity, but no further comments have been heard or taken into consideration by the director. Director Daniels has not taken the time to hear out families and provide for transparency in this issue. It was also requested that the director adopt the policy of previous director in the meeting with the Nevada Cure, as well as other organizations as such as the ACLU and Return Strong, who all had very involved in bringing the voice in the incarcerated people and families to their concerns to the site. Director Daniels was to begin the meeting with this organization to allow for discussions and any issues allowing for input and on any AR changes and new ARs and allow involvement in the vetting process. Governor Sisolak encouraged this to Hello, occur, caller. yet it has not. Pardon me, caller. You have 15 seconds to wrap it up thank you thank you he has it produced the same exact proposed policy after being told by the governor and the public at 80 percent is unreasonable there's no revised proposal for this either for the board to review these are the things that director daniels before the ar258 can be promptly and ethically implemented the director has had a fair opportunity to prepare a revised public policy he did not do as directed we ask that you Hello, well, for those folks that would like to submit written comments via email, please email them to BOPC at doc.nv.gov. Thank you. What happened to the last caller? Did, did she get cut off mid sentence? I think she was, um, she was um, invited to, she had 15 seconds. I think she ended that call. Okay, if I could ask the callers, please limit your comments to two minutes for public comment. We've got a lot of people want to talk. And if you could limit your comments to two minutes, we've given you the email address. We'll give it to you a few more times where you can email your public comments, your written comments. Next caller, please. Or set with the phone number ending in 7833. This is your opportunity to speak. Please unmute your phone by pressing star six. Good morning, my name is Jen. I'm here with Return Strong Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated, and I have a loved one incarcerated in Nevada Department of Corrections. I'm here today to speak to the proposed changes to AR-258 under the guise of Marcy's Law and express my deep concern with what appears to be actual disdain for the lives of incarcerated people, in addition to blatant defiance by Director Daniels. On September 1st, when the temporary AR was enacted, there were multiple levels of harm that impacted incarcerated people who owed restitution. 
At the October 8th meeting, the board voted and, the, and directed NDOC to revert back to the original AR-258 that is dated May 2018. We left that meeting believing the deduction would be corrected the same day, but that the AR would be fully reinstated in its original form. That never happened. The gift coupon program is critical to many incarcerated people and would have been the only protection that many had from the director's unreasonable garnishment. The gift coupon program gave incarcerated people $500 twice a year that would be protected from deductions, $1,000 a year to buy underwear and socks and a blanket or pillow, maybe a few dollars of music, hygiene products, a game of chess, coffee. Let's really break this down. The gift coupon, if well managed, gave them $83 per month to take care of all their needs because as we have previously addressed, NDOC does not take care of them. They are not living in luxury or excess. They are barely surviving. The director blatantly ignored the directive by the board to return to the status quo, the original version. We are here today to ask that you not only vote no on the revised proposed version of AR-258, but also order that the director reinstate the gift coupon retroactively as promised by their own employee in November, 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hello caller with the phone number ending in three, six, nine, five, please star six, your phone to unmute. It's your turn. Good morning, Governor Sisolak and commissioners. We appreciate your time this morning, especially with this um, frustrating technology. This is Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada. I have three quick points to make, but I'll be on the line for the duration of today's hearing on AR-258. But I first wanted to point out um, some, some um, facts about Marcy's Law, what Marcy's Law means in this context. The intent of Marcy's law is to create a cause of action against the government when they violate a delineated right, not to impose those duties on a criminal defendant, the accused, et cetera. Outside of the prison setting, indeed, a judge can order restitution and they can seek to garnish wages, but they must do so, but they cannot do so at a rate that leaves a person destitute. Um, yes, Marcy's Law requires that all monies collected must first be paid toward restitution, but that means collected by the government, not all um, monies earned by the individual. If that were the case, that would be a clear violation of the takings clause. Um, second point, incarcerated individuals, the case law is quite clear, they have a property interest in the trust account and any funds deposited therein. Yes, the government may garnish those accounts, but it must be reasonable, and an 80 to 90 percent deduction cannot be objectively reasonable. Finally, the proponents of Marcy's Law during the deliberations on that law in both 2015 and 2017 made clear that nothing in Marcy's Law was meant to interfere with any constitutional right of the accused. As to the restitution provisions, the proponents of Marcy's Law made clear that it was meant to make victims whole, not to leave victims destitute, not to affect the property interest of those individuals, and not to affect the, the income um, and deposits of families. Anyone claiming on the record today that, um, that somehow Marcy's Law entitles them to nearly all of an individual's money in a trust fund should review that record very clearly. And otherwise, that claim is false and made in bad faith. And I wanted to make that clear. I will remain on the line for further deliberation. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Holly. Next caller, please. Hello, caller 9128. Please start fix your phone. You're next. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Serbin, S-E-R-B-I-N, and I was a victim of a gentleman who uh, had taken money unwillingly from both my family and I. He is currently incarcerated. I would just like to make the comment that we have not received any of our money back from this gentleman. Um, in my opinion, he gets uh, three square meals a day. Uh, he gets free health care, which I do not get. And I would certainly hope that we uh, would continue to take as much money from them 
so that we could have our money returned to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Hello, caller 3101. Please star six your phone. You're next. Good morning. This is Tyler Ingram. <clears throat> My last name is I-N-G-R-A-M. I am the Elko County District Attorney. I'm also the president of the Nevada District Attorney Association. Uh, as you guys probably already know, uh, our association is made up of the 17 elected DAs um, throughout the state of Nevada. And we took a vote and discussed this, this issue that we're talking about with uh, Administrative Regulation 258. I just wanted to point out that we had 16 DAs participate in that vote and all of them were in favor of supporting the deductions. I think that speaks volumes about our association's position. Um, and I, I, what I'm going to do is simply re reiterate what arguments you've already heard uh, about this particular policy, but I, I think they're important nonetheless. Our legislature twice and our voters in the state of Nevada overwhelmingly supported to amend our constitution to protect the rights of victims. And um, this sort of policy in, in 258 uh, is exactly supportive of those constitutional protections. Um, and as you already know, the, the two rights that speak directly to this issue in our Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, subsections 1, letters L and P, um, Section L being to full and timely restitution. I think that I can speak on behalf of victims that uh, full and timely restitution is nearly non-existent. Uh, section P entitles victims to have all money, monetary payments, money, and property collected from any person who has been ordered to make restitution be first applied to pay the amounts ordered as restitution to the victim. You know, I think we all have uh, stories about um, victims who have not received their restitution. And $20 here and there may not seem like a lot of money uh, to, to some people, but even a $20 payment to, to some victim could mean the world to them. Uh, that could be the difference between paying bills and putting food on their own table. So as, as the Elko County DA and also as the president of the Nevada DA's Association, we urge you all to support the amended uh, Regulation 258. I appreciate your time. Thank you, caller. Thank you very much for your comments. Next caller, please. Caller 0499, please star six your phone now. Your opportunity is now. Hello, my name is Jody Hawking. I'm the founder of Return Strong and am here today to really protest the implementation of the very unreasonable restitution that the revision, the revision to AR 258 would implement. I wanna take a minute and give some examples of how restitution is implemented in other states under Marcy's law, because we are not against victims getting restitution, but we are in favor of both being fair to both victims and people who are incarcerated. In Wisconsin and North Dakota, there's a maximum to the garnishments that's allowed from outside sources. In Florida, community work inmates who work outside of the confines of the community relief center, center in private in industry are required to use 10% of their net wages to pay court ordered restitution. In South Dakota, they use a sliding fee scale that's determined in part by the incarcerated person. They fill out an inmate financial worksheet and then determine what percentage of their money will be distributed to court ordered obligations. This is really a very rehabilitative approach giving incarcerated people a life skill that's needed when they return to society. According to Stephanie May from the South Dakota Penitentiary Operations Secretary, Secretary, the majority of court ordered obligations are not paid by the offenders and incarcerated. They're paid when the offender is working in the community after their release or paroled. There's nothing in the Illinois revised statute uh, or the Department of Corrections policies that allows for the garnishing of money sent in by families for the payment of restitution. Illinois is able to meet the full and timely restitution law by requiring that whenever possible restitution is to be paid within five years of release. It excludes periods of incarceration. Again, the director did not do his due diligence in finding reasonable policy for restitution. Families have never asked or called for an end to restitution, but just for a fair policy that is reasonable and meets an undefined definition of fair policy. Other states have done it Hello, and so caller. can we. Hello, caller. Please summarize now. Your time is up. I'm done. Thank, Thank you. you. Comments. Could I ask everyone that is not speaking to please mute your phones so that we can hear the... Uh, 
the speaker. Next caller, please. Hello, caller with the phone number ending in 5085. Your opportunity to speak is now. Thank you. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Denise, and my husband is an inmate in the Nevada Department of Corrections. Like many others that you have heard from today via letter and voice, our family has been affected by the garnishments placed on inmate accounts at NDOC. Director Daniels deemed it reasonable to deduct up to 80% of the money received by inmates to pay restitution. He says that only impacts 1,800 people, that that is not true. It may be 1,800 that specifically owe victim restitution, but his plan doesn't focus on only on victim restitution. He is collecting on medical bills and child support, court costs, fees, even the state-ordered DNA test, and ultimately this garnishment is falling on us. The families of the prisoners in Nevada, we and our children are paying the price and the impact of these deductions. Speaking for our family, for my family specifically, we did not know if the garnishments would apply to us, but we also literally could not afford to take the risk. We tested an amount to see the outcome would be, and he got $4 out of the 20 that I sent as a test. The state left him indigent with less than $10 in his account. We are a blended family with six children and financially and financial stress that was already there was made five times worse by this, literally five times worse. The only way we can make it financially each month is by sticking to a very strict budget. And even then we live paycheck to paycheck with little to no wiggle room like many, like so many other Americans. Our monthly budget includes all of the normal living expenses, but it also factors in $120 for my husband to spend on hygiene and food and what they are given by NDOC and deemed as significant is in no way significant in either quality or quantity. With this garnishment, I would need to spend to send my husband $600 a month for him to continue that or to continue to have that $120. I would need to take on a part-time job to be able to afford this, but with our children, distant learning and cost in childcare, it is not sustainable for us, not to mention dealing with all this during the pandemic. We must remember that regardless of crime- Caller, please summarize, your time is up. Okay. My husband, like thousands of other humans before their inmates, as such, they are worthy of being loved and thought of and cared of. The money we send to our loved ones is how we can convey those things, especially at times like this. Um, just vote no on the AR-258, please. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, caller. With the last four of 2563, please star six your phone. It's your opportunity. Okay, um, my name is Tiffany and I'm with Return Strong Families United for the Incarcerated. I'm calling to speak on the AR-258. I'm calling as a victim, even as a victim and with the harsh reality of what things could have happened to me from the people that are currently incarcerated. I still, not do, I still do not believe that the AR-258 is a fair and reasonable percentage amount to be taken from the incarcerated. I do not believe an individual should have to pay for his or her restitution until they are no longer incarcerated because this comes from their family, not them. Marcy's law states that it is timely and fair. In this so-called revision of the AR-258, it is not timely or fair. I truly believe other victims would feel just as such, but haven't had the chance of public comment or just haven't heard about it. I truly hope you find it in your heart to understand that this is inhumane, inhumane and not all, not all right to do to your family members or to anyone that is your loved one. We forget to realize that the money given from family members is not only if they get a top ramen or not a pack of um, M&Ms. This also helps them to get hygiene products like toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, conditioner, things that people like me and you could not live without. But they are having to do so because of the so-called revision, but the deputy director and the governor has that in place, and it's not a revision. The only person that can change this is the governor and the deputy director. Please do better on this revision. That's all I have for now, and please just vote no. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Caller with the phone number ending in 9271. Please star six your phone. Your opportunity is now. Hi, my name is Tammy Irvine, and I'm with Return Strong, um, with concerns with AR-258. I have a friend at High Desert State Prison 
Um, a while back when I went to visit, I noticed that the vending machines, the food was astronomical. Um, when I walked back, I asked why. And I was told that the majority of the money goes to victims. Um, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's a good idea. Um, what I don't understand is um, why this law wants to take up to 80% or more. The people living in France pay 40% on their income um, and they get what they need. Why would an inmate need to pay that much when they work pretty much slave labor? Don't get me wrong, it's good they're working. Also, how can inmates in general population pay any kind of um, restitution when they're working, when they were working five days and now then they went down to two and now they were told they're not gonna be working for three weeks. I hear um, the general population inmates working in the card room, they went from 100 inmates now down to 60 and they're supposed to work and do the um, work of 100 inmates with employees. Um, how can an inmate pay anything if prison industries in high desert is not hiring anyone? <clears throat> um, the inmates pay for their bare necessities, such as toilet paper and shoes. Um, they are not living in a life of luxury. They are living in the um, condition of lockdowns 23 hours a day. Please take no action at this time. Thank you. Thank you, caller, for your comments. Next caller, please. Hello, caller 5779. Please star six your phone. Your opportunity is now. Yes, hi, my name is Nicole and I'm a member of Return Strong and I'm calling regarding the matter of AR-258 and the actual harm that this could do to many incarcerated persons and their loved ones. On September 1st, 2020, AR-258 was modified without the discussion or approval of the members of this board. During the October meeting, this lack of discussion and the hardships that this has said cause, as well as the ratios of withholdings were discussed and thus the decision was made to halt the changes and revert AR-258 to its previous form. Unfortunately, it was not reenacted in its true form as evidenced by not reinstating the gift coupons, which allowed an individual biannual deposits without deduction, although it is currently stated as available on page five on the act of AR-258. Another point that came to light during NDOC's inability to follow the procedure or modification of policy, the process of being vetted through multiple layers of NDOC, DAG, and the Office of the Secretary of State, and that the, where the review sent to the board was not done. It was discussed that this would be rewritten and reproposing change. And yet here we are again with the same proposal that was already determined to not be reasonable. Something that did not change, however, since the last meeting was the hardship that this would cause to those inside and their loved ones. We are still in this pandemic, leaving many suffering financial hardships, adding the increased burden to ensure that their incarcerated loved one has enough food and hygiene products to survive in prison, which is less than sufficient. Let's remember these are people and not numbers in a computer. Does anyone find it odd that Director Daniels has to seek approval for the revision of office letterhead, but does not require approval to change the financial withholdings of thousands of individuals or even the entire closure of a DOC facility as discovered in the previous meeting? It is this unilateral decision-making power that I find utterly disturbing. This board exists for a reason and these types of issues should be vetted through the board prior to initiating these policies. I not only ask that you vote no to changes in AR 258, but also enforce any policy changes we discuss with members of the board prior to initiating them so that these type of events will not happen in the future. Director Daniels, more than any previous director of prisons in Nevada in the recent years requires oversight and accountability. He has repeatedly shown that please vote no, or at minimum take no action to this make, and make this make him do what was asked on October the 8th. And I would also like to add that prisoners do not receive three square meals a day. And they do not receive free health care. We actually pay for that as well. And it is, it's, it's just unthinkable that you would continue to take money from people who obviously don't have it. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Caller with the last four of 0244, please star six your phone. Your opportunity is now. Hi, my name is Barry Lenhart, L-E-N-H-A-R-T. I'm a victim of an inmate that's been incarcerated for a few years now who uh, uh, took money from us, um, from both me and my daughters and other family members and other members throughout the, the county. Um, he was uh, incarcerated for this, uh, followed his chain of events, and I've seen he's gone from prison to prison, unwilling to work, unwilling to do anything, and unwilling to be able to participate to give our money back to us or even get something back. Even $5 would be nice, but he has shown no remorse. He also has uh, constantly filing lawsuits against district attorneys, police officers, at no charge to him, 
but of us if we've been charged with it for legal fees that we need to obtain to do this. So he's had a plenty of plenty of privileges. Uh, again, I'm a former law enforcement, and I can tell you that um, he showed no remorse. And I'm sure there are inmates that have probably performed as as a good inmate, but I'm speaking on behalf of the one and the following that I've seen of this inmate and recommend that you continue with uh, AR-258 uh, and enact the new one. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, caller with the last four of 9826. Please start six your phone now. Your opportunity to speak is now. Good morning, my name is Ayana, and thank you, Governor, for your time and your attention to this matter. I'm a member also of Return Strong. My husband is incarcerated at Nevada Department of Corrections, and I am here to express my concerns with the proposed changes to AR-258. Director Daniels has stated that this Marcy's Law calls for full and timely restitution, and at the last meeting said that he would implement these changes due to the requirements of Marcy's Law. But what requirements? There is no time period nor specific monetary values listed in the Marcy's Law, and there are no definitions from the terms of full and timely. In the Nevada Constitution or NRS, therefore, how are the values of AR-258 determined? How is a policy based on a change to the state constitution becomes implemented when there is no requirement except that it be reasonable? It is reasonable to garnish 80% of anyone's funds, let alone some of the most indigent and marginalized people in our state. I say absolutely not, and I ask that you vote no to the changes as AR-258. There are many states that have implemented Marcy's Law that were fair to both the victims of crime and to the people who were accused of convicted of the crime. In South Dakota, the incarcerated person sits with the caseworker and determines these things. And also, I would like to add that this is a double jeopardy because the families are paying the restitutions and the inmates are doing the time. Therefore, if they're not getting inadequate, I mean, if they're um, not receiving proper health care, they're not, um, they have to pay for all these different things, but they don't work a job but a dollar an hour, 25 cent an hour. In some cases, we go to work, we submit the money, so they're doing the time and we're making the payments. That is unacceptable. We don't mind paying the victims, but 80%, that's astronomical. If the living conditions in Nevada Departments of Corrections was fair and humanized, it would be one thing. If we treated our pets the way that the inmates are treated, we would be criminalized and incarcerated as with them. It is unacceptable. And with that, I close. Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Caller with the last four, six, nine, five, six. Please star six your phone. Your opportunity is now. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Carson, last name C-A-R-S-O-N, and this is regards to AR-258. Uh, on November the 7th, 2010, my daughter Michelle was murdered, strangled to death with an extension cord, set on fire, and buried three and a half miles out in the Las Vegas desert. She was just 25 years old, college graduate, and getting ready to work in the criminal justice system. The pain of losing a child to murder is unimaginable. When I was told that my daughter was murdered and the details of how she died, I went into complete shock. I went completely numb. At the same meeting, I was presented with several documents to sign. One of the documents was to forfeit my right to restitution. I really was not processing anything at the time. All I cared about was to find the person that murdered my child and bring him to justice. I did sign not to proceed for restitution. I really wish I had not signed. As it turned out, he was captured four months later, and it took eight long years before the murderer accepted a plea deal. He put my family through so much stress for eight years, and he is through the legal system, and he's continuing to do that. Thinking back, I should have waited to sign anything because of the state of mind I was in finding out my daughter was murdered. But in closing, I really uh, always be grateful 
for both myself and my family, how I was treated by the Las Vegas uh, detectives and Elaine Green, also the DA's office. They were so kind and compassionate. I had two victim advocates, Joanna Rash, Chelsea. They were both remarkable and caring, along with Robert Daskus, the prosecutor. Robert was always so kind, compassionate, and very patient. He was very honest with both myself and my family. Robert would always keep us informed of all the legal process uh, that was going on for, uh, for, for eight years. I got a lifetime sentence of grief knowing I will never see my daughter again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, caller. Uh, next caller, please. Hello, caller with the number 9151. Your opportunity to speak to governor is now. Good morning. My name is Denise two S's, and I am here with Return Strong, Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated, and I would like to briefly speak on concerns that we have specific to the proposed revisions of AR-258, specifically regarding NRS uh, 176A.430, Section 6. In the NRS, it specifies that failure to comply with the repayment of restitution while on probation or parole is considered a violation unless it involves economic hardship. This is regarding those able to work and provide for themselves. Those who are incarcerated are not able to do so and are wards of the state and dependent on family members and friends to support them. On the streets, the person would file a waiver for economic hardship and have their case reviewed by the court. There is a basis to review the appropriateness of the repayment schedule in order to ensure that the person can meet the conditions of the repayment. Why then do we not stop and create a policy that allows for fair and timely restitution to both parties? What would that would reflect a thoughtfully planned policy that both protected the victim's right to restitution and the convicted person's right to humane treatment by the state. Many of the court documents for these cases stipulate that the restitution would be paid upon the offender's release from prison. Since Marcy's law seems to be the stated basis making this revision necessary, please know we are fully aware that Marcy's law does not require this level of abuse. As we have shared, most Marcy's law states do not take money sent by the family. They take reasonable deductions from inmates who are working and have their own income. Family contributions are not considered income. In South Dakota, inmates sit down with a caseworker and work on a budget from their fund and commit to restitution payment. That is a rehabilitation-focused approach to restitution. An inmate on death row sent us a very powerful letter, and in it he said, the restitution I was ordered to pay confused me because I'm legally forbidden from earning a wage because I'm on death row. I cannot work prison labor. I am expected to suffer in isolation due to the status until the day I'm executed. Have no access to rehabilitation as I am condemned to death without hope or expectation of rehabilitation. You cannot have it both ways. Either you want me to pay for my crime monetarily or you want me to pay with my life. By choosing the latter, you can't have the former. Governor Sisolak, Attorney General Ford, and Madam Secretary, please vote no on AR-258 revisions today. The director had an opportunity to come back with something reasonable and refused to do so. Thank you. Thank you, caller, for your uh, comments. And could I ask you to please give out the address for written comments to be submitted again, please? Yes, sir. Like. Written comments, please send those written comments to BOPC at doc.nv.gov. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the last four of one, two, two, two. Please star six your phone now. Your opportunity to speak is now. Good morning. My name is Elodie Hutchinson. I would like you to please take a minute to walk in my shoes. It was almost a year ago that visitation was suspended in Nevada. States have gotten organized to maintain family connections crucial for mental health and rehabilitation. Some have even managed to reopen visitation safely for months now without an increase of their cases. In Nevada, there is no such thing, no communication, no plan or perspective, not even a bit of reassurance that we will ever see our loved ones again. Then, and despite the toll this pandemic took on everyone's finances, the rules changed with no warning, and my loved one started to get only a fifth of the little money I was able to send him. Despite the two free phone calls a week, there is no such thing as family connection. When the lines are so long, your loved one can't make it to the phone or when they are, again, on lockdown. When my loved one tested positive for COVID, I couldn't sleep. 
I could barely eat. I was worried sick. He was in a bad shape and I could barely speak to him. No treatment was given to alleviate the pain, but thank God he pulled through. And now we found out the new rules for the mail starting in February. No more greeting cards or kids drawing. The only thing my loved one had left to look forward to. Imagine you live, you love someone. You can't see them. You can barely talk to them over the phone. You can't support them financially. You can't send them a card to cheer them up. You can't take care of them. You can't do nothing but worry and wonder how you will survive this. When this should be a moment to treat each other with a little extra kindness, with compassion and flexibility, the pain of the families of the incarcerated only gets worse and remains ignored. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Hello, caller with the last four of 0007. Please star six your phone now. Your opportunity to speak is now. Once again, caller with the last four of 0007. Your opportunity to speak is now. Good morning. I'm just, I apologize. Attorney Lisa Rasmussen here. So um, I'm going to address something a little bit different than what everyone else has been addressing because I'm hoping Governor Sisolak and Attorney General Ford that you can ask some difficult questions um, regarding the upcoming agenda for this morning's meeting. We lack, as attorneys, any sense of transparency from the director with regard to COVID and inmate infections and inmate treatment and what is being done with regard to the inmates at Nevada Department of Corrections. And the problem with no transparency is that it doesn't allow us to make decisions as to how to further the interest of our clients. For example, um, I have clients who are in the hospital and we have no information about them whatsoever, zero, nothing. And, uh, and then the hospital says that they're not there and we know that they're there. We, I, here's another example. I have clients who are in various institutions within NDOC and they're told that the staff are bragging to them about not getting vaccinated. So I'm hoping that you can address whether or not there's some policy as to staff vaccinations because we all know that that's how inmates get infected because staffs bring the infection or the, the virus in. Third, um, we are one of, I, we may be the only state that has not enacted any kind of system to address elderly, frail, infirm inmates. In many, in many instances, they're close to release, and we have no way to get them out. I, I know that this has come up at the sentencing commission meetings, and nothing was done, and there is currently no system. In federal court, Attorney General Barr enacted by executive order a system where inmates could ask the director or the warden at their institution for early compassionate release to home confinement. And in many instances, they were granted that. If they were close to the end of their sentence, they were old and they had health conditions. They're subject to recall should the pandemic subside if they're still serving their sentence. In federal court, we are allowed if the uh, Bureau of Prisons doesn't grant that request at the administrative level, we can file a motion and we can ask that a court hear it. We don't have any system in Nevada that addresses any of that. So I'm hoping that you can ask these questions um, in the upcoming agenda and that we can have a robust conversation about what we're doing to make sure that inmates don't die and that the public can actually have information about what's going on. And more importantly, we as the attorneys can have information about what's happening with our clients so that we can take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, caller. With the last four of 7301, please star six your phone on mute. Your opportunity is now. Good morning. For the record, my name is Kimberly Mall, M-U-L-L, -L, with Kimberly Mall Advocacy Consulting. I'm an advocate and policy expert on victims' rights and was one of those swinging votes in favor of Barchi's law in the late hours of Friday night in 2017. 
six months later, I also became a rape victim in Reno. Now, there's nothing I would love to tell you more than my rapist is in prison, but it's been three years and two months since my rape, which means it's been three years, one month, and three weeks since Chris Hicks' office has proactively reached out to me, so I'm guessing my rapist is not behind bars. But what I can tell you is that if he was in prison, of course, I would want every penny of his commissary money taken away. Not because it's going to come close to paying restitution. It's not going to pay my counseling. Did we lose that caller? Not sure what happened, but it appears so. Okay, if that person wants to call back in, they can wrap it up. When they call back in, we'll put them to the front of the line if you would. Next caller, please. Well, the caller with the last four of 8693, please star six your phone to unmute. Your opportunity is now. Hello. I am Shirley Evans, wife of inmate one, two, three, nine, three, eight, nine, age 79, convicted of DUI with fatal two to five years. He has no priors. He has a disability of Parkinson's with Lewy body, which affects his reasoning ability. Pacemaker for bradycardia, orthotic for foot dropsy and sleep apnea, letters of high risk for COVID. He has been at HDSP for 60 days, 40 days hospitalized for falls, 20 days quarantined by himself with bed, toilet, and sink, entire six days without phone or mail, CPAC machine, and foot orthotic. My husband was physically able to care for himself at home before prison. He could not be responsible for finances or driving. He fell and had a laceration on the back of his head requiring a trip to the hospital that lasted 20 days. The director of nursing described to me after the first hospital stay that he is in a wheelchair and needs help with everything he does. He was quarantined again. I called to check on him and the director of nursing told me he had fallen again and was at the infirmary getting stitches on his arm. He said he would call me when he came back. He never came back. After a week, the director called to tell me he had a subdural hematoma and COVID and was in a local hospital. He has been in the hospital for 20 days. I have not talked to him since Thanksgiving. This is inhumane treatment for a person with a disability. He needs help filling out necessary paperwork. I do not know how to speak with his caseworker and a nurse, Bonnie, told me they would call me when he is dying. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, caller, with the last floor of 3846, please star six your phone to unmute. Your opportunity to speak is now. Hello, my name is Adrian. I'm with Return Strong. I'm concerned about the policy to take deductions of 80% for victim restitution. There's no other state that is taking this high amount. Many states that pass the version of Marcy's law do not take these deductions from families. And when California passed Marcy's law, they increased the deduction from 40% to 50%. That is a 10% increase. Nevada's gone from 20% to 80%. What is the justification for increasing this deduction 60%? What purpose does it serve and what research was done to decide this number? Several court cases have been heard on the issue of ex post facto issues with judges restitution. Different courts have provided different opinions on the question of ex post facto and restitution. The Constitution denies ex post facto changes to punishment after a crime has been committed, meaning that a new law cannot increase the penalty of someone who has already been charged for a crime. Is restitution a punishment 
Most courts have said restitution does not qualify as punishment, but they have not ruled on this situation where inmates are virtually deprived of the ability to receive money from their families. This is putting inmates under financial duress and depriving them of supplemental food and other important supplies. And it is cutting them off from their support system. I ask you to vote no on AR 258. I think more research needs to be done. Um, it is clear that this is put in without any consideration of how other Marcy's Law type legislation has been implemented. And there are a lot of um, humanitarian implications. There are a lot of legal implications, um, especially as the law guarantees victims the right to um, bring court cases against public employees in the uh, implementation of this law, there needs to be a uh, full review of what um, of what exposure there is to this implementation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, caller with the last four of 9167. Please star six your phone to unmute. Your opportunity to speak is now. Caller 9176, please unmute your phone by star six. Your opportunity to speak is now. Last try, caller 9167, your opportunity to speak is now. Okay, one time we said seven six and the other time six seven. So either one of those, if you're on the line, you're up. Okay, we'll go to the next caller with the last four of 7301. Please star six your phone. Your opportunity to speak is now. This is Kimberly Mull again. Um, for the record, the phone system told me I was muted by the host last time. Um, so returning back to what I was saying, um, of course, I would want every penny of my rapist mission money taken away from him um, but that is not going to come close to paying for restitution um, or my counseling my monthly medications um, or things to that extent but Marcy's law was lobbied for and passed to give us victims equal rights under the law not so the state has an excuse to create a new category of victims our abusers keeping those who have harmed us from having access or easy access to things the American Red Cross considers basic necessities, such as toothpaste, tampons, and Tylenol, is not going to make victims whole. But would I want all of my rapist commissary money taken away? Absolutely. But that comes from a place of vengeance, not justice. And vengeance has no place in policy decisions. Look, if we're talking about 1,800 people, then cap all deductions, restitution, and operating costs, and pay 100% of that to victims until restitution is paid. But do it at the normal rate. Then go back to collecting money for the operating costs and other fees. That's one way we can work this out if the state has finally decided that paying victims restitution is such a priority, but doing it in a way that is respectful and humane to the decency of people who are also incarcerated. Um, I want to please urge you to re-examine the current proposal for AR 258 and please understand and Remember that Marcy's Law, those of us that were in the trenches lobbying for it and begging people to pass it, did not have this or things like this as an intention while doing so. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for your comments, caller. Next caller, please. Hello, with a caller with the last four of 9167, 9167. Please star six your phone now. Your opportunity to speak is now. Good morning. My name is David Figler, D A Y V I D F I G L E R. I'm an attorney in Las Vegas in the criminal justice system. Prisons were developed as a means to proficiently, if not coldly, punish large populations of humans who have been convicted of a wide range of felonious conduct, some for the first time, by depriving them of liberty, stripping them of as much agency and humanity into compliance as they can, and presumably rehabilitate or at least scare them into a better behavior upon release. In the best of times, this model is cruel and inexact. The legislature creates ranges of time for punishment. The judges pick a term of punishment, but make no mistake, there is zero evidence-based data that the specific time assigned to a person's incarceration in any way is a precise measure for the stated goals. Indeed, it is clumsy and often inhumane in that some of the most vulnerable are left to myriad horrors counterproductive to any sort of rehabilitation or betterment. In the best of times, they live in fear, are isolated from familial support, are subject to exploitation, violence, gangs, threats, and PTSD. Disease is not uncommon in our prisons, in much higher rates than our community, as the hepatitis C crisis has proven, a crisis we continue to pay for, both in terms of resources and human life, but nothing as much as the current pandemic. In a word, prisons are ill-equipped to handle a pandemic of this magnitude. This is evidenced by the fact that not a single executive order has mentioned any specific protocols as applying to the prisons, because by nature of the prison system, such basic protocols are impossible. We have heard the NDOC say they will do everything they can to protect prisoners and staff, but they can't. The release numbers are finally catching up to the predicted reality. The only answer all along has been some measure of depopulation. Depopulation is possible, and it is the only humane thing to do. It is the only moral course to take. County jails do it all the time, and federal prisons, as have been mentioned, have been doing it for far worse criminal offenses since the pandemic began. The Nevada statutes provide for a means for the prison director who answers to this board to evaluate who is at risk, who can qualify, and finding alternative means for them to finish off their sentences, including residential confinement. He is not doing this. As a side note, an executive order from the governor in an emergency such as this and or the pardons board can also accomplish the same. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people in NDOC right now who can qualify for a statutorily compassionate styled release to residential confinement under existing statutes if the director is given a clear directive to do so, because Hello? it is clear it will not happen Hello, without caller. it. Hello, caller. You've had your two minutes. Can you please summarize? Yes. There can be a ar less arduous process since there are ample resources in communities to identify these older individuals, nonviolent individuals, vulnerable humans with a home right now to return to and a safety net to allow them to comply with any terms of such a release. Thank you for your consideration. Please direct the director to do what he is charged with doing. Thank you, caller, for your comments. Next caller, please. Sir, we don't appear to have any more callers at this time. Okay, last chance. Anyone else for public comment? Seeing and hearing no one, would you give us yourself Sir? one more time? Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Were you calling for- Good morning, public? Governor. And Yes, I am. I was not called upon. Uh, I just barely unmuted. Good morning, Governor and Commissioners. My name is Kevin Ramped, Labor Representative with AFSCME Local 4041. Respectfully, I was hoping to see the exhibits A, B, and C posted on NDOC's website. Those exhibits were not posted as of this morning. Therefore, I cannot see the detailed changes being proposed. I'm thankful just to receive a summary recently by NDOC on AR 100 and AR 307. However, AR 14, well, I'm sorry, AR 114, section 114.01, subsection six, highlighting prison board of commissioners meetings requires the Department of Corrections to post the ARs uh, and the exhibits that are being changed. This was not done. Respectfully, therefore, I have to oppose the ARs being presented today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Anyone else calling for public comment? Yes. Hello? 
Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Thank you, Governor Sisolak, for seeing M-A-H-A, R-I-S, and I have just a few points to sum up. First, I definitely agree with Mr. Figler and Ms. Wellborn, and no on AR-258, please. Number one, uh, we've asked for use of force update from 215 from our office, Freedom of Information Act, starting about a couple years ago. And DOC has never uh, given us a reply so that we know if we're make, making progress against violence or not. We need that report. Number two, uh, we're please asking to certify prisons to standards like schools and hospitals in Nevada. Very important. I've been asking since, uh, I believe, 2001. Number three, uh, no, I can find no answers to whether the June 20th U.S. DOJ letter was ever answered and whether the, uh, excuse me, recommendations have been fulfilled for individuals with disabilities in prisons. Number four, we need to reform the grievance system and use neut neutral decision makers instead of people who know the individuals who are filing grievances. I believe that probably 95% grievances are turned down. Um, number five, verbal abuse classes are needed for all to quell violence. Number six, an extremely important COVID reports we have coming in say that they don't, they're not getting their results in a timely fashion and it's causing tremendous psychological unrest. Number seven, will you please eliminate the thousands of work hours of transcribing uh, these meetings and we can save freight train loads of money by adopting total transparency with no untruths. Uh, I'd like to uh, please have the 25th meeting of November corrected in which the words musical activity were purported to come out of my mouth. They did not. And to correct an action, I did not attend the March meeting in 2020 because no notification ever arrived, though Tammy and Cynthia assured me that it would. That's why I missed your first meeting to welcome you. And uh, number eight. Caller, if uh, I got to ask you to wrap it up a little bit, your past two minutes. So if you could wrap up your comments. Yes, I'm finishing now by begging you to support uh, AR258. I'm, I'm sorry, to uh, support Bill Draft 496 on removing slavery from our Nevada Constitution because slavery is what it is in small plantations. And you can okay. hear the pain Thank in everyone's voice. Thank you, caller, for your Thank comment. you. Do we have anyone else for yes. comment? Hello, sir. It uh, doesn't appear we do. Uh, if there are any callers out there, please star nine your phone so we can see a raised hand uh, indicating that you would like to speak. Do we have anyone else? Doesn't appear so, sir, yet. Okay. I'm going to give you one second, your last chance on this one. No new entry, sir. Okay, thank you. I will close public comment for the first section and move on to item number three, acceptance and approval of minutes from the October 8th meeting. Do we have a motion? I move approval, Governor. We have a motion on the floor from General Ford. Any discussion on the motion? Here and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye.
Secretary Sagastia, General Ford. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. I said aye. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. Secretary, are you still with us? Uh, we still have a quorum and we have two votes in the affirmative. Could I ask staff to call Secretary Sagaski, try to get her back on the line if she's available, please? Hello? Could I ask staff to please call Secretary Sagaski and try to get her back on the phone, please? Yes, sir. This is Director Daniels for the record. Yes, we will contact Secretary Sagaski. Okay, thank you. Item number four, we'll move off the minutes. They are approved. Item number four, uh, corrections update from Director Daniels. Uh, good morning, uh, Board of Prison Commissioners. This is Charles Daniels, Director of the Nevada Department of Corrections. As of January 22nd, 2021, NDOC has an offender population of 11,015. Okay. Director, I'm going to uh, interrupt you for just a second. Secretary Sagaski texted me. She's on, but somehow she can't get unmuted. Could I ask staff to work with her on that, please? Yes. Yes, sir. Keep going, Director. As of January 22nd, 2021, NDOC has an offender population of 11,015 and 26, uh, 2,693 active employees. This number excludes pending transfers from local jurisdictions and any new hires. Since our last meeting, NDLC has been actively working with both the COVID-19 task force and DHHS on our agency protocols on uh, PPE, testing, and vaccinations. NDLC continues to experience critical staffing issues at Ely State Prison. Unfortunately, due to various reasons, the institution averages between 90, uh, averages roughly 90 vacancies, 45 of which of the vacant positions have been reassigned to other facilities across the state, not due to a lack of need, but attributed to the lack of an applicant pool. NDOC has presented a reclassification request of both uh, Ely State Prison and High Desert State Prison to the governor's finance office to consider as a solution to our chronic understaffing. This afternoon, NDLC will be presenting the agency's budget request to the Legislative Commission's Budget Subcommittee. Also this week, we will appear before the Executive Branch Audit Committee for the presentation of the first of a series of fiscal audit findings and recommendations. Additionally, Christina Leathers, who is our, human, our Chief of Human Resources, and I continue to actively participate and labor negotiations. Finally, I would be remiss if I failed to publicly acknowledge and extend my gratitude to NDOC's hardworking staff, both uniform and non-uniform. Despite the extraordinary and debilitating impacts COVID-19 has had on staffing, changes to protocols and challenges to the personal lives, their tireless commitment has directly contributed to our ability to remain agile and steadfast in the fight against COVID-19. Please allow me to turn over, uh, turn this meeting over to Dr. Michael Manev. He's the medical director of the Nevada Department of Corrections, and he will provide a brief overview of both uh, hepatitis C as well as COVID-19. Dr. Manev. Thank you, Director. Uh, the Nevada Department of Corrections has been proactive and flexible during the COVID-19 pandemic through the implementation of agency-specific CDC and local health authority guidelines. With the advent of the COVID-19 vaccine, the Nevada Department of Corrections is currently prioritizing vaccination efforts on all eligible staff members. Given that staff members are constantly interfacing with their communities, they are most likely to spread the virus to other staff and to susceptible offenders. As of January 20th, 2021, 746 DOC staff members have been vaccinated for COVID-19, which is approximately 28% of all NDOC staff members. Town halls and education of staff and offenders continues on a weekly basis with the aim of increasing compliance with this life-saving vaccine. Offenders will be vaccinated in order according to the designated age cohorts created by the Department of Health and Human Services. 
The Nevada Department of Corrections has been approved to administer the COVID-19 vaccine at its major facilities and will continue to work with local health authorities to procure sufficient vaccine to administer to inmates and staff members. The close collaboration of the Nevada Department of Corrections with the Governor's Finance Office and the Division of Emergency Management has yielded personal protective equipment for all NDOC staff and offenders. At this time, NDOC staff and offenders have sufficient personal protective equipment through April 2021. In addition, the acquisition of approximately 40,000 Binax Now rapid COVID-19 test kits has allowed the NDOC to more effectively identify infected staff and offenders in a timely manner. The NDOC, NDOC test staff has both staff and offenders for COVID-19 on a weekly basis. Weekly testing for COVID-19 has not only reduced the frequency of offender outbreaks, it has also facilitated the clearance of staff to return to work in a more timely manner. The Nevada Department of Corrections continues to identify and treat offenders infected with hepatitis C. As of January 21st, 2021, our medical providers have identified 749 offenders with active hepatitis C infection. 166 of these offenders are priority level one offenders according to Medical Directive 219. Initially, the Nevada Department of Corrections had forecasted a total of 2,400 hepatitis C positive inmates based on our internal intake data in addition to estimates provided by the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. NDOC Medical has partnered with Host Clinic to facilitate the treatment of these offenders. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. This is uh, Director Daniels. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manev. I'd like to pause for a moment and turn this over to questioning or send it back to the governor as he chooses to move forward. Uh, no, I, I want to get a correction here, though. Secretary Sagaski had a correction on the minutes. It's been corrected, Director? Yes, yes, sir. It was. Okay. Secretary, can you hear me? Okay, we're still having a little trouble getting her connected here, if you could keep working on that. Okay. No, I do not have any questions on the, uh, the update. Do you want to, well, I can't get any from Secretary Sagaski. So General Ford, do you have any questions? No, sir, I do not. Okay, let's move on to item number five, uh, Dr. Azam. Uh, good morning, Governor and esteemed members of the board. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. For the record, Eisen Azam, State Chief Medical Officer. You already have a copy of my report, so I will briefly highlight some important points. As required by the NRS, the Division of Public and Behavioral Health, uh, conducts regular inspections of state correctional facilities. Our inspections include medical and dental services, dietary and sanitation services, and nutritional adequacy inspections. Five deficiencies were identified during the medical and dental inspections at two surveyed facilities in 2020. Seven state prisons were inspected for dietary and sanitation services, Four of those had no violations, and the other three had each, either one or two violations. Deficiencies were corrected during the inspections. However, violations which couldn't be addressed and resolved by the end of the inspection were promptly addressed by the prison compliance officers. A nutritional adequacy of inmates diet was verified by on-site direction, directive or direct observations, document reviews and interviews with correctional facility staff. No nutritional adequacy violations were identified during our inspections. The Department of Health continues to support the efforts of the Department of Corrections to prevent and contain COVID-19 outbreaks. Our epidemiologists recently inspected prison facilities that they were experiencing severe COVID-19 outbreaks and practical recommendations were generated to control these outbreaks and prevent future ones in prison facilities. Prison guards, as Dr. Menev mentioned, and the staff in the prison were prioritized 
for vaccination and currently receiving their COVID vaccines. With this, uh, I'm concluding my update. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Do we have any questions for Dr. Zab? General Ford, no? No, for me, sir. Secretary Sagaski, did you get on yet? Uh, can we give the secretary another number to call in or somebody spoken to her, Director Daniels? Hello, now can you hear me? They just told me I was unmuted. Yep, I hear you now, good, okay. Okay, they unmuted me and I don't know how they muted me because I was on in the beginning. <laughs> well, let's keep her unmuted. Okay. We appreciate it, thank you. Okay. My, my my question overall uh, for the director and, and everybody is um, just if we could get these um, comments uh, written instead of verbal, is there a, a reason that we have to get them verbally or can we get them in writing? Hi, uh, this, is, uh, this is Director Daniels. Uh, I believe this is the portion of public comment and the persons wishing to leave comment can write them as well as call so it was an option. No, I think her question is, can we get the reports that we're getting, yours and Dr. Azam's written, as opposed to just hearing them verbally? Can't they be written and included in our books? Sir, no, that would be no problem from our end and uh, Secretary Sagashi. Uh, certainly, we could send you a written copy. Thank you. Is that what you were referring to, Barbara? Yes, thank you very much. And it's very hard to hear them, um, yeah. but I hear you clearly. <laughs> Good. Thank so you. I speak loudly. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We will close item number five and move on to item number six, Administrative Regulation 258. For which yes, uh, Governor, this amount is, of public uh, Daniels, and I'm going to turn this response over to uh, Deputy Director. Uh, Christina Shea, and she's the Deputy Director of Support uh, Services, and she will discuss, discuss AR-258. Governor, this is Barbara Sagaski. I, I can't understand anything that's being said. Um, and what I would like, though, is if at some point when you want to hear from us that you ask um, uh, my uh, Chief Deputy, uh, Scott Anderson, to um, discuss uh, his conversations with your office and with the director. And thank you. And we did do it in a very timely manner, just saying thank you to Scott. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary. Okay, Director. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you too now. So you're either going to have to speak directly into the microphone or get closer to it or something. Good morning, Governor Sisolak and members of the board. Can you hear me now? Yep, a lot better, thank you. I can, I can talk loudly for sure, so Good. I can make that happen. Um, this is Christina Shea, Deputy Director of Support Services. Um, and I just wanna do a brief overview of the um, AR-258, how we got here. And then I'm going to pass over the, um, the floor to the chief of, our Chief of Inmate Banking, um, sorry, Inmate Services and Purchasing, Venus Bahoda. And she's going to walk the group through the recommended um, revisions for the board's consideration. So in November 2018, um, citizens voted in favor of amending the Nevada Constitution to expand the rights of victims of crime, um, um, formerly known as Marcy's Law. Um, specific to victims, um, specific restitution, the Nevada Constitution now states that each person who is the victim of crime is entitled to the following rights, to full and timely restitution and to have all money, payments, money, property collected from any person who has been ordered to pay restitution to first apply to pay the amounts ordered as restitutions to the victim. Um, as background, prior to Marcy's Law, statute allowed the Nevada Department of Corrections to deduct victim-specific restitution from deposits and payroll greater than minimum wage. Um, and therefore, as um, we've heard today, um, the department had a policy of deducting 20%. Um, and just as a sort of large overview, that 20% that represented 1% of our population, uh, our, our population at that time. Um, however, 
um, the, the the current um, population that we're, we're referring to is roughly 16% um, that this would impact. So to be compliant with Marcy's law, um, the temporary AR-258 um, included an 80% recommendation for victims of, of crime restitution deductions. And um, the department um, recommended this based on the, the law and it appeared reasonable that 80% was recommended based on um, the law as it writes, as it stands uh, currently. Um, at, the, at the last board meeting, the board requested um, a, some additional information about um, additional states and the department was able to do some research and 13 states have some version of Marcy's law. Um, Nevada appears to be a more aggressive in the rights now guarantee, uh, guaranteed to victims. Um, California and Nevada require victim specific restitution to be paid first. And California currently collects 50% towards victim specific restitution plus a 5% mid, uh, 5 administration fee. The temporary AR expanded population, as I stated, um, is impacts the victim that impacts the victim specific restitution deduction um, is going from 1% to 16%. Um, between September 1st, 2020 and October 8th, 2020, the department has collected approximately $220,000. And th these funds are sitting in the trust account for final determination. Since the last board meeting, the Nevada Department of Corrections has worked with the governor's finance office, I'm sorry, the governor's office, the secretary of state's office and the attorney general's office and we've reviewed feedback from the ACLU, advocacy groups, um, and inmate and uh, victims. We've analyzed the various departments' um, obligations by population. Um, we've also, um, the department's taken into consideration um, concerns expressed. Um, and today the department is presenting an updated revision for the regulation. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Venus Vahoda to the group and she can take it from here to go through the specific revisions um, for the board to consider. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Venus Pahoda. I'm the Chief of Purchasing and Inmate Services. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, so I'm here to provide an overview of the revision of AR-258 presented for your consideration in approving today. First and foremost, this updated version prioritizes restitution deduction so that the department is compliant with Marcy's law. The restitution deduction has been updated to 50% and will be applied to all payroll and eligible deposits. The percentage is a reduction from the 80% in the temporary AR presented at the last board meeting. To clarify restitution, um, restitution is ordered by the courts during an offender's judgment and conviction and is payable to a specific person. Restitution is not used for the benefit of the department. The Department of Collection, or Corrections excuse me, collects that restitution and sends 100% of what is collected to the Division of Parole and Probation. From there, P&P sends 100% of what we've sent them directly to specific victims. When drafting this revision, we closely evaluated all deductions allowable by statute and the percentages that have been and could be applied. We focus our efforts in finding a balance with being compliant with the intent of Marcy's law while alleviating the strain on inmates and their loved ones. As a result, we also reduce the deduction for the amount collected towards department debt reimbursements from 50% to 20%. In general, it was our assessment that reducing this deduction would result in our population keeping more funds received from their families compared to the temporary AR. We're also aware of their concerns um, that because of the increase in the restitution deduction, that our population would not be able to purchase items through the commissary, such as additional food and or hygiene items, or even phone time. The department does offer a package program where loved ones can purchase specific items directly. Um, families can also prepay phone time through our phone vendor. Um, other than the restitution deduction, the AR revision also includes an increase in the minimum limit for the savings account, from $400 to $550. It eliminates the gift deposit program, and it also simplifies our internal processes for transfers between an individual um, offender's sub-accounts. With that, um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to address them. Well, I think there's gonna be quite a few questions. Does that complete the presentation, Director? Yes, Governor. Okay. Administrative Regulation 258. Okay. 
Uh, I want to open this up. General Ford, do you want to start? Do you have any comments or questions? Or yeah, I do, uh, Governor, and um, I just wonder if it's more appropriate to offer them during the discussion component after a motion, or do you want me to just start talking about it, generally speaking, to see if we're going to have a motion one way or the other? Well, why don't you talk about it, and then we'll decide on a motion how you want to handle this. I'd like to know where you and the Secretary stand. So, Very good. Uh, thanks, Governor. Um, I, I will say this. I have obviously been briefed on this and done some independent research on the issue related to AB 258. Uh, and I'm persuaded that Nevada law allows NDOC to deduct from a inmate's trust account monies for specific purposes. And per Marcy's law, that the first monies that are collected from an inmate with a restitution order have to be first paid toward restitution and that the victim in, the, in that regard has a right to, and I quote, full and timely payments in that regard. Um, I understand that some advocates, although I don't think we've heard many on public comment today, but some advocates of Marcy's Law have suggested that every dollar that is placed in an inmate's trust account must be collected and distributed as restitution first, and that uh, NDOC has no discretion in that regard. I don't ascribe to that view, and in fact, I'm reminded of a colloquy I had with proponents of Marcy's Law during the hearings on this matter when I was in the state Senate, uh, where in response to one of my questions, the proponent testified that the word timely factors in a payment schedule uh, and are based on an analysis of the convicted person's ability to pay uh, and that the constitutional right simply affords the order for restitution. If a defendant cannot pay, they can't be forced to do so because there cannot be debtor's prisons in this country. And that's a quote from the advocate there. So in view of this, I agree, as others have suggested, that the NDOC does, in fact, have some discretion in determining the amount to be deducted uh, and that that discretion will be upheld as long as the amount is otherwise, uh, otherwise comports with Marcy's law, uh, especially the full and timely components. Again, having researched the issue, I'm further persuaded that the revised proposed uh, rule setting that amounted 50 percent as opposed to 80 percent, which was the earlier suggestion, actually would, uh, complies with Marcy's law. Uh, and I would support that um, um, uh, proposed revision to AR 258. And Mr. Governor, I would turn the mic back to you, um, uh, but, but abs absolutely open to having further discussion on this issue. Thank you, Novin. I, I, I just want to fully understand your position. Are you proposing or suggesting 50% in addition to this 5% administrative cost that they're talking about, or the 5% come out of the 50% that is used for victims? Well, I, I was saying 50% in total, but I'm interested in hearing, maybe maybe I didn't understand exactly what the proposal was, but dropping the 80% number to 50% um, was, was sufficient for my purposes relative to this discussion of uh, how much of um, the trust accounts, um, the MA's trust account, how much NDOC will collect from it. Uh, because okay. based on that collection, they have to turn out first monies toward restitution to those who have orders for restitution. Okay, let me ask Director Daniels then, is the administrative cost that was brought up, which is today what I'm hearing about, the 5%, does that come out of the 50 or 80% that's allocated for the restitution? Hi, hi, Governor, Christina Shea for the record. Um, so just to provide clarification, that 5% that was a comparison of California. So in California, they're, they're taking 50% plus 5%. The re revised AR 258 does not include 5% for administrative fee. So what are we doing for administrative fee? The AR does not include any administrative fee. We, and in, we're not charging anything. Okay, interesting. Okay, well, we can decide whether or not we want to do that. Secretary Sagasti, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, Governor? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay, did you have any comments or? Um, I would love it if there's an opportunity for um, uh, Scott Anderson to, to speak about his experience working with them. And we did have this done in a timely manner, um, just to let everybody know. Um, and I, my biggest question is, did the people that talked in public comment see the revised revision online or are they going off of what was on there before? That's my big question. But I do want to say that I am very happy with this um, new version and um, would also support it um, as the AG has stated so elegantly. Um, but I just wanted to see if anybody else had seen this no, revision. Okay. So let me first, so you're supportive of the 80 or of the 50? No, of the 50. Okay, then do you want, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, staff member Scott, did you want to say something, Scott? 
Certainly, Governor. This is Scott Anderson, Chief Deputy Secretary of State for Secretary of State Barbara Sagaski. Um, I do appreciate the time that we were able to spend, I believe it was last October, with Department of Corrections staff and going over some of the concerns that we had. And a lot of those were just in the form of content of the, of the AR. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate them taking those into consideration and making uh, most of the, uh, of the changes. Uh, the concern that we had is that uh, there was a concern with the amount that was being deducted uh, and with some of the comments that we were hearing in relation to uh, so much being taken and not being allowed, uh, the inmates not being allowed to have some of their funds. And uh, our biggest concern now is that uh, we just received this. We did not receive the briefing that the, the AG uh, Mr. Ford was able to receive. And we received this uh, with the rest of the meeting material, or, or excuse me, after the initial meeting materials were sent on, a, on Thursday, late Thursday. It doesn't give us a whole lot of time to really do a, a real thorough review. Um, my suggestion would be in the future as we're looking at these is that we get some sort of executive briefing as to the rationale behind the change prior to it coming to us. Um, so like the AG, we agree uh, that the NDOC has the authority to set these amounts. Again, we were concerned about the amount of the deduction. Uh, it appears that this has now changed to be um, consistent with what many other states are doing uh, and hopefully will uh, satisfy uh, both sides of the argument. Mr. Governor, if I could clarify real quickly. Please. Uh, the briefing I'm talking about is an internal work product briefing uh, that I got from my staff, not from anyone else from NDOC or otherwise. I just wanted to be clear people understand that component. Uh, and further, I would note that California likewise, um, albeit before uh, Marcy's law, has a 50% deduction rule uh, separate and apart from the 5% that you talked about, you've, you've acknowledged that. Uh, and so, you know, it is in line at least with, there is some precedent at least for uh, that level of deduction for restitution. But I did want to clarify that my briefing wasn't from NDOC per se. It was an internal analysis that I had to do to be certain that I was ready for today's. No, got that. Thank you. Well, let me, uh, Scott, does that wrap it up for you or you have something else? Thank you, Governor. I, I think that that's about it for me. Uh, I appreciate the time and I do appreciate the time that the NDOC did with us, uh, to spend with us uh, after the last. OPC meeting. Uh, again, I would just stress that it would be nice if we could have a uh, some sort of briefing as to the rationale behind any AR change, and then uh, uh, get these a little further ahead of time, as we've said in previous meetings, so that we have adequate time to review. Okay, and I will speak with Director Daniels. If you could get uh, Secretary of State a briefing ahead of these, it would be very helpful. Should I say public requisition? Okay, I got a couple questions here. Uh, what is the order of restitution? If there is money set aside for restitution and there's more than one victim or there's several areas of restitution, what is the order of that? Is all, that all decided by the court? Maybe General Ford, you can answer that or the DOC, who? I don't have that answer off the top of my, I hit my head, Governor. And if NDOC doesn't have it, I can absolutely assign that to some research and get the answer to you, so sorry. Okay. And Doc, do you have that answer? Yeah. Hello, Governor. This is Randall Gilmer, uh, Chief Deputy Attorney General for the Department of Corrections. Um, as AD4, we can certainly look into that issue with regard to the prioritization among victims. However, I would just like to point out again, we collect the money and forward 100% of the money we collect to parole and probation. So parole and probation may already have that information and I will obviously speak to my colleagues at parole and probation on that issue. But the money that we give, we give all to parole and probation and parole and probation then uh, divvies that out to the, uh, to the people who are entitled to restitution pursuant to their rules and obligations that they have. Okay, uh, this coupon program that several people mentioned, do I understand that they can get a coupon or whatever you want to call it, a voucher, twice a year for up to $500 that no restitution comes out of? Is that right? 
So the um, governor, this is Christina Shea for, the, for just to connect with you on that. The um, right now, the temporary AR would um, would eliminate that program. So currently, with the 2018 AR, that's correct. That that gift program is in in it is in in that AR, but that AR 258 revisions would eliminate the gift program. Okay. Then the other question I've got: When someone said they can purchase prepaid phone cards or phone minutes. Do I understand that a family member or friend or someone on the outside, so to speak, can buy prepaid minutes for an inmate to make phone calls? This is Venus Cahota for the record. Um, so yes, Governor, the uh, families can um, uh, place funds, phone time um, directly through our phone vendor. Okay, but if they do not, and the person buys the phone minutes out of their commissary account, whatever their account is, then it's subjected to the deduction, correct? Venus Bahota, for the record, uh, correct. If families send funds in directly to corrections, those funds are, are subject to deduction. Okay, well, and I'm gonna get, ask General Ford here because I'm gonna ask him to make his motion much more specific. What sense does it make that if the family member puts it directly into minutes, there's no deduction? But if they put it into their account and then they use it to buy minutes, there is a deduction. Mr. Why Governor, would we have um, so I'm going to offer this um, um, per, per your question, and, and I'd love for my dad to chime in as well. Um, in the interest of, of, of true full transparency, I think there is a reasonable debate on uh, how Marcy's law is intended to operate and supposed to operate under the language of the law. Uh, when it relates to when it states that money is collected from an inmate, um, I heard one of the first uh, testifiers say that money put in a trust account is not collected from an inmate um, un unless that money is collected by the government. Um, garnishment being an example or um, um, in doc saying, I'm going to take this money out of your account. That is money collected from the inmate. And under those circumstances, Marcy's law would require that before the government does anything else with that money, it has to first pay restitution in a full and timely fashion. Um, an argument on the other side uh, is that restitution doesn't apply, uh, or Marcy's law wouldn't apply to the monies in this trust account uh, at all uh, because it's not money collected from an inmate. It's money collected by an inmate. Uh, and so it seems to me that the end run around you're talking about uh, lends credence to this reasonable minds debate. Uh, and, and my suggestion would be that, um, you know, we, we afford um, the level of discretion to NDOC to determine how they want to employ it as long as it comports with a reasonable interpretation of the law. And in that regard, I would suggest that if on the one hand, uh, you won't be removing money from someone because they purchase a gift card, uh, then on the other hand, you should not be removing money from someone if it's placed in a trust account because that's elevating form of a substance, especially in terms of the debate that can be had over the phraseology of Marcy's law. Um, there is a tenant that talks about legislation and constitutional uh, um, law that uh, wants to wants to avoid rendering things that have been passed unconstitutional. Uh, and I'm endeavoring to do so as well by supporting the 50% uh, component, uh, recognizing that there, there are ways to uh, implement that that would um, more, more directly comport with the language uh, in, in ways uh, that are more indirectly um, um, aligning with it, but nonetheless potentially um, defensible. So it's a roundabout answer to your question, but I think the direct answer is, in my estimation, if you won't be removing money, uh, money from an inmate if they buy a, if, if the family buys a gift card, then you shouldn't be removing money from the inmate if that person puts that amount of money into the trust account. It's tough to segregate that money, but um, I think it lends to part of the debate that can that could cause pre future problems. Reasonable minds can disagree, including from my DAGs. Uh, and so if uh, um, if my deputy attorney general, frankly, wants to chime in and offer a contrary view, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, but that's my that's my position on this, Mr. Governor. Well, thank you. And I'm going to ask my uh, legal counsel to chime in, too, if they choose to. If your dad wants to say something, please go ahead. Hello, this is Randall Gilmer, Chief Deputy Attorney General for the Department of Corrections. Uh, thank you, Opportunity uh, Governor and uh, AG Ford and uh, with regard to the governor's specific question, I do think, and, uh, and A.G. Ford indicated, this is one of those issues where reasonable minds may differ. 
but I do believe it goes down to the fact that once money is into a, uh, a trust account, which I will refer to as a bank account, because generally speaking, the trust accounts for inmates is treated as if it, as it would a bank account be in the private sector. Once money is in there, the position is that the money is available for restitution because it is very difficult to uh, to segregate funds uh, because of the fungible nature of funds. And so that would be the distinction we would make with regard to why if money is taken in, 50% could be taken, whereas if prepaid phone cards or packaged items are provided to inmates, that is money that never went into their account to begin with. So it was money that was never collected by, uh, to use uh, the phraseology that was referenced earlier and that AG Ford mentioned uh, by the inmate because it was a gift that was provided. And so therefore there is not, no money in the account with regard to those issues to be collected from the inmate by the, by, the, by the government entity here. I hope that answered your question, Governor, and I hope that uh, AG Ford understood my uh, distinctions there as well, if there's any other follow-up questions. I did, Mr. Governor, and just, just, I wanna be clear as well to anybody out there contemplating uh, a uh, litigious response to this analysis, recognize that there are absolutely ways to refine the process uh, such that uh, any uh, challenge would be um, 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 dismissed, uh, dismissed in court uh, outright. So uh, what we're trying to do here, here is, is facilitate uh, the, the purpose and intent of Marcy's Law uh, in a way that doesn't elevate form of a substance and, and would uh, appreciate everyone recognizing that uh, as we continue this discussion. No, I agree with you 100%. Director, let me ask you this question. Are the families all aware of the fact that they can put minutes on someone's account and not send in money? Are they aware that they can do that? Uh, this is uh, Director Daniels for the record. We have published that information and the inmates use, utilize the program to the extent to whether everyone is aware. I can't tell you that, but it's clearly posted and it's available for the inmates to uh, share with their families. Okay. Okay. And they can also send a package of items a couple times a year. I remember this part, right? Whether they be toiletries or uh, food items or whatnot. Yes, uh, Governor. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, Ms. Bohoda, if you'd like to chime in since that's your uh, area of expertise. So um, Venus Bahota for the record. Um, so families can um, purchase about $150 of food and $275 um, in clothing and hygiene items per quarter. Okay. Okay. Uh, Secretary, do you have any further questions? Secretary Sagaski, any further? Uh, no, I can't okay. think of anything else. And I just want to tell you that I've enjoyed listening. So thank you both very much. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the very robust discussion and the public comment. Uh, I'm very heartwarmed by a lot of the victims that are saying that they think there needs to be an adjustment because they don't want to see someone punished uh, even more and not be able to you know, get the access to these things. And I know there was some emotional testimony and I sincerely appreciate everyone taking the time to participate. That being said, General Ford, could I ask you to make the motion? You said you were ready with the specifics as it relates to the items we talked about, the coupons, prepaid cards, all that kind of stuff. Um, Mr. Governor, um, I, would, I would move as we have discussed uh, and um, move to adopt the policy um, as amended per discussions with the deduction being 50%? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what about administrative fees? Do we have any idea with parole and probation what this fee is, what this cost is to administer a program like this? So, I don't. Um, but Director Mr. Daniels? Uh, Governor, I do not know. Uh, Deputy Director Shea or Ms. Bahoda, would you happen to know that figure, the administrative cost? Um, this is Christina Shea for the record. I, m as far as the figure to operate the the specific this specific aspect of the deductions, I mean, in general, we have a division that um, in inmate banking that performs significant amount of um, cal calculations, deductions, and as a whole. 
um, and all of that sort of taken into consideration. So um, one of the things I will uh, again reiterate is, is that in order to make this 50% work, the department is reducing um, the NDOC reimbursement from 50% to 20. So therefore the department's really trying to make a collaborative effort to um, take everything into consideration. Um, so I think that in our, in, in our mind, um, the, a 5% fee, um, it doesn't appear to be something that would be uh, recommended at this time. Okay. So, uh, and it would be your intent, General Ford, that this motion uh, and this change be done retroactively for this quarter of a million dollars that's already on deposit that they're waiting to get a direction on? Uh, yes, sir, it would be. Okay. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Does everyone understand the motion, Secretary Segeski? Um, Yes, and um, the only question that I would have, does this have anything to do with um, the director coming back to you for approval on any changes, or is this just on this um, uh, administrative regulation 258? My understanding is it's on this administrative recommendation for 258 as it relates to the inmate banking. Okay. And, and that, would be, that would be the, the purpose of my motion as well. Uh, frankly, I, I would not want to venture into other, uh, you know, other processes uh, that the state has already laid out for purposes of adopting ARs. So, right. Okay. We have a motion okay. on the floor. Any further discussion? This motion will change the deduction to 50%, correct? To yes, sir. Retroactive. All the people on the line. We have motion on the floor. Any further discussion? All in favor? Sing Mr. Governor, I'm sorry. I don't think you got a second. I don't normally get one. Oh, okay. Well, I did you Go need ahead. a second? Yeah, no, we'll take one. Fine. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Director. And if you could move on that retroactively to the money that's being held, that would be uh, appreciated. Mr. Governor, yeah. hold on. If I could, just one second, sir. Um, um, could we ask Mr. Gilmer to chime in on the 50% issue that was just raised? Um, just in case we need to revisit this before we go further, uh, because I may have not been, maybe not been appropriate. Mr. Gilmer, can you chime in, please? Yes, thank you, AG Ford. Um, and and that definitely understands that the 50% will be the amount taken moving forward and a temporary uh, AR will be drafted in that regard. With regard to the money that was already collected, uh, uh, with, with respect, I would humbly request that we have some time to review that particular issue because since that money was collected under a temporary AR, I am concerned about, uh, I think there might be some additional legal research that needs to be done as to whether or not that money can be returned as opposed to provided to the victims because at that point in time, the money has been collected by the government. So I have concerns and, and obviously knowing the board's desire, we will look to see if that's, uh, possible to do, but I do believe it's that we might need some additional legal legal opinion and research into whether or not 30% of that money could be returned to the inmates and or however the breakdown of 80% versus 50% works. I have some concerns about that since it was already collected. And so I think we might need some additional research on that particular component. But it was collected under a regulation that this board never approved of, correct? Uh, yes, you Governor Rand Randall Gilmer, Chief Deputy Attorney General. Uh, that is correct, uh, Governor. However, it was collected under a temporary regulation that is uh, that the direct that Director Daniels and the Director of NDOC has provided authority under law to do. While uh, until uh, the Board of Prison Commissioners gets to decide to approve or not approve, and that very well may be the reason why we can do it. But I do think that we should take a look at that particular issue before we make any definitive decisions with regard to the amount of money that had been collected. Okay, Sir. you you want to bring that part back to us at the next meeting? I'm fine with that if my colleagues are fine with that, but today moving forward, I want it changed. Is that clear? I'm sorry, uh, Governor, you broke up a little bit. Can you just repeat that? Um, but yes, moving forward, 50% will the, all that will be taken and nothing has been taken since the last meeting as well. Okay, very good. That's my Mr. Only Governor, point. I'm sorry to muddy up your, your meeting here, but I think we have to take some procedural steps to effectuate all of this discussion here. 
Um, I think I have board counsel on, on the line, but it seems to me we probably have to rescind the previous action. I need to issue a new motion that only talks about prospective uh, and then that the 80% uh, stuff they can bring back to us to talk about uh, on monies previously carried. Okay, but let I, me do it this on. way. Do I have a motion to reconsider the last action? So moved. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Now you want to go ahead with the new motion. Yes, sir. Um, I moved as I just recently stated, but not not retroactive. Got it. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay, and the motion would be that they would come forward with a plan at the next meeting, correct? Uh, that's part of the motion as well, yes, sir. Yeah, right, thank you, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, we all on the same page now? Governor, this is Director Daniel. Since it uh, will go back to have further discussion, I would recommend that uh, probation, parole and probation be a part of it based on the fact that they have a better understanding of their administrative fees, to which I am not comfortable with trying to define what those may be. Yes, that's great. They're welcome to come to the next meeting and voice an opinion as it relates to administrative fees, any burden this might cost or whatever, but yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number seven, administrative regulation, 100 administrative regulations. You know, this is uh, Director Daniels, DOC, and uh, Christina Leathers, our Chief of Human Resources, will uh, take this issue. Good morning, Governor and uh, members of the board. The major change to Administrative Regulation 100 is the timeline for employee reviews, reducing from a two 14-day review period to a seven-day review period as well as identifying an executive um, administrative regulation policy panel consisting of a minimum of a deputy director and warden chief or medical director to oversee revisions. The benefits of these changes is reducing the time frame for administrative regulations revisions to be completed and the executive team will have direct involvement over timely updates. That is all I have. Okay. Do we have any uh, comments from the board on that? None here. See none. Do we have a motion on this one? I move approval. We have a motion for approval. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Item number eight, administrative regulation 307 furlough policy. Uh, Christina Leathers, Chief Human Resources Officer, for the record, Administrative Regulation 307, Furlough Policy. The revision is based on the 31st Special Session of the Nevada Legislature, identifying the period of furloughs, the required number of hours, and the impact to benefits. Thank you. Do we have any questions on Administrative Regulation 307, Furlough Policy? None here, Governor. Secretary? None, Governor. Okay. Do we have a motion? Move approval. We have motion on the floor. Is there a second? Yes, second. We have motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Did I get two more ayes? Aye. Yes. yes. Okay. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number nine. If this is the second time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board on any item, please step forward, identify yourself for the record, and comments be limited to two minutes. Do we have any public comment? Hi, yes. Uh, my name my name is Michael Keck. Can you hear me? Yep. <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, this statement <clears throat> is uh, regarding Ely State Prison. Uh, Warden Gitter, uh, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing his name, uh, has been running Ely State Prison by a series of memos used to circumvent the established policies and in turn the NRS chapters. Um, examples, male deprivation enforced by staff via memo, further defining prohibited male with language not present in AR 750, inmate male. Indefinite property deprivation specifically used to retaliate against prisoners who set fires to protest conditions. 
the pretense of an ongoing arson investigation of personal property that invalidates ARs 704, 705, 711, and AR 707 inmate disciplinary, which was revised in 2017 according to nationwide prison reform standards. <clears throat> My tax dollars pay for the salaries of public servants <clears throat> voted into office, excuse me, and employees underneath them, including the wardens and staff of NDOC. I do not pay taxes to have people appoint themselves to supreme authority in this country of law and fairness. As an entity of the criminal justice system, I expect NDOC, by extension Ely State Prison, to abide by the laws it represents under the Nevada State Legislative Body, not to subvert those laws to further oppress an already oppressed group of people who act in protest as the grievance system has also been rendered ineffective, subverted by memos denying grievances outright without review and respect restricting grievance access to one per week. I would like a vote for an investigation into the administration of Ely State Prison. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any other public comment? Hello, caller with the phone number 2861. Your opportunity to speak is now. Please star six your phone. Good morning, my name is Patricia Adkison, A-D-K-I-S-S-O-N. I tried to uh, make comments uh, two hours ago, but wasn't able to get in, uh, or they didn't call my number. Um, please include my comments in the minutes. My comments relate to a possible action related to agenda item number six, seven, and eight. The notice of today's meetings and agenda was posted on January 21st. However, the agenda directs the public to submit supporting, uh, supporting materials to this board by January 19th. This unfortunate oversight effectively prevented submission of supporting material by the public that this public body would otherwise reasonably rely on to look to deliberate today's action. Foreclosure in this way implicates violation of NRS 241.035 subsection 1D and the deliver deliberative process contemplated by the agenda as required by chapter 241, preventing the general public's written remarks from becoming incorporated or deliberated upon before taking action. The violation of the provisions of Chapter 241 in this way renders any action this board takes today void. Pursuant to NRS 241.036, the elected public officials that serve on this board were not elected to be a rubber stamp for the director's policy. We did not elect the director. This board's apparent refusal to comply with the Nevada Administrative Procedures Act when establishing minimal procedural requirements for regulation making and adjudication procedure renders all actions by this board a de facto rubber stamp. The legislature, I'm sorry, the legislature establishes minimal procedure requirements for the re regulation making and adjudication procedure of all agencies of the executive department empowered to improve regulations and state government for the judicial review of both functions except for those expressly exempted pursuant to provisions of NRS 233B. The fact that this board is charged with regulation making duties and not expressly exempted clearly envision the board's compliance. However, the department's exempt status stems from the fact that the department lacks authority to approve regulations not already defined by limits set forth by the legislature without the oversight and minimum due process safeguards provided for by law, whereby this board is acting as the ultimate authority or head of the department. Attorney General Opinion Numbers 96-24 recognize this distinction, but simply to be the head of the department does not reduce this board's legal obligation in this regard. It increases it. Governor, the proverbial fox is guarding the hen house, and as chief executive officer, you're responsible for the department actions. I have appeared before this board and the board of examiners. I reported department actions that implicate criminal conduct, including the department's unilateral criminalization of USC Second Amendment. If the board wants to review some of these facts, you can see NDOC grievance 200631-05130. NRS 239 contemplates approved minutes at the board's next meeting. However, because the board does not meet regularly, Excuse circumstances me, like that. Excuse me, caller, you've exceeded the two minutes. Um, please be advised that you can uh, submit written documentation at BOPC at doc.nv.gov. Okay, and when I do, will those be in the minutes? 
Yes, of course. Hello? Okay, thank you so much. Have a good day. Hello, Governor. We have one more caller. Hello? Hello, caller 1725. It's your opportunity to speak. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Shepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K. I am a policy fellow with the ACLU of Nevada. Uh, quickly, uh, for the record, um, AR-258, uh, the proposed one was never posted uh, for the public to review, hence some confusion earlier. I just wanted to get that on the record. Uh, my comments are regarding COVID, though. As of today, there have been almost uh, 5,500 confirmed cases of COVID in Nevada's correctional facilities, with 45 deaths among prisoners and four among staff. We are rapidly approaching a 50% uh, positivity rate of all incarcerated people. As a state, we have done almost nothing to slow the spread with incarcerated people moved uh, off of the vaccine priority list. It is critical that we take action now. Failure to do so will lead to more preventable deaths. States across the country have implemented a variety of approaches to slow the spread in prisons, with the two most popular options being executive orders from governors to release those close to expiration who meet certain criteria, and the increased use of parole, probation, and pardon sports. Some governors have reduced the medically vulnerable, and at least half a dozen governors have used their commutation powers to reduce population. Louisiana created a temporary medical release program, and Connecticut gave their DOC discretionary release powers. Uh, Wisconsin, Maryland, and West Virginia have released those who are being held on probation and parole violations, while New York released pregnant women. Hawaii created a system to allow public defenders to petition for release. This is all to say that Nevada is in the minority of states who have done nothing, and its incarcerated population is now paying the price. It is not too late to do so, as so many others have done. Once again, we are asking the board and governor Sislak to act to save lives. We offer our assistance in developing a plan. Failure to act will lead to the death of some of Nevada's most vulnerable people, whose health and safety is the sole responsibility of the state. Uh, we must act now, and I thank you for taking my comments. Hello, caller. Good morning. Of five two six two, it's your opportunity to speak. Please unmute by selecting star six. Thank you. Once again, caller five two six two, it's your opportunity to speak. Please star six your phone to unmute. It's your opportunity to speak. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Kiki, and I am with Return Strong Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated. In the next two minutes, I will do my best to point a picture of you, of what my brother's life looks like inside. At this time, he is currently housed in NCC. He is suffering excruciating pain for months and knew the cause of the pain was cancer that he had been told was gone. Despite his medical history, he was not being treated. He begged to see a doctor and sent a kite after kite requesting to be seen. I know for a fact he asked many times because I was out here doing the same thing, leaving messages after messages with different people from, from the warden's medical staff and have attempted to reach the director to try to get him some help, but got no response. Finally, in his desperation, he punched himself in the face so that he, hard so that he could get blood into his mouth so that he can cough up blood. Only then did he get to go see a doctor. At that time, they discovered he did, in fact, have stage 3 lung cancer, and he had to perform emergency surgery on his chest, which caused two broken ribs. The doctor prescribed medication, morphine. However, his ribs never healed. He has also been told that the cancer is progressive, and he, as he sits in his cell day after day in quarantine, not able to receive packages, not able to receive any of his clothing items that have been ordered for him due to being ill, he's not able to receive any sort of commissary. He still waits day after day for treatment. As of today, he was bought, I'm sorry, as of yesterday, he was bought a wheelchair because he is unable to walk. It has been two and a half months and he is, since he has been told that he has been, will be sent to get chemo immediately, and he has yet to receive medical treatment. My brother was not sentenced to life, so therefore I'm not understanding why he is not given the right to fight for his own medical treatment. I'm asking for someone to step in and allow my brother Terry to be seen 
by a cancer doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Sir, we have one more caller and no. we have two more callers, pardon me. Caller with the last four of three and four six, please unmute your phone. It's your opportunity to speak. Hello, my name is Adrian. I'm with the current phone. And DOC never explained how they came to the number 80%. They were requested to provide that information. Um, during this meeting, they revised the amounts, but we, the public, have not had the opportunity to view this revised revision. I thought that opening meeting law required materials to be available to the public before, before they are voted on. Is there any reason that we were not allowed to review it? I received an email that implicated there were no changes to AR-258 since it was left uh, presented. Even now, after this motion has been voted on, we do not know what it contains. I do not feel like NDOC is being above board on these issues. They are making decisions without sufficient research and without due process, and then scrambling to handle the fallout, this is especially the case in the handling of COVID-19. I believe that the state of Nevada is responsible for the well-being of the people they house in correction facilities and it is failing in this respect. They need to take immediate steps to protect inmates and to release any eligible, eligible inmates. Um, we need to have an independent investigation into the NDOC handling of COVID-19. And I would like to also express um, that and ask that you take immediate attention to Terry Clark, who is um, is fighting cancer in the in the correction facility. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, caller. With the last four of four four zero four, please unmute your phone by pressing star six. Now it's your opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good morning, honorable governor and commissioners. This is Kevin Ramp with Ask Me Local 4041. I would like to thank NDOC for directing me to the appropriate area for the exhibit for review. In the future, I would like to make a suggestion respectfully requesting that any ARs be submitted with a red line to be able to see the changes. I was unable to do that with the short amount of time that I could review them this morning. And with that being said, prior NDOC administrations were tasked by prior commissioners to submit the changes with a red line it makes it easy to read and identify the changes to be transparent we appreciate your time and thank you thank you very much for your comments anyone else no other hello? hello i guess not do we have a caller hello. yes hello go ahead yes ma'am <laughs> Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you. This is Mercedes Maharis, M-A-H-A-R-I-S. The elephant in the room is what has happened to the IRS stimulus checks for our <laughs> prisoners? Hello? Yes, we're listening, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Um, does the same deduction happen? to the IRS checks. Uh, I remember that not nearly all prisoners got the applications for the $1,200 check. And I sent in four myself and it's been months and they have received nothing that I know of as of this morning. So how much is NDOC going to deduct from the IRS stimulus checks of $1,200? Number two, the COVID positive inmates are unable to get counsel from their MDs in order to find out whether they qualify if they have had COVID, such as Robert Ramsey, who was in Centennial Hospital 11 days with COVID and pneumonia. He does not know. And so all prisoners who have had it should have a consultation with their doctors, in my opinion, to be safe in taking this vaccine. 
please assist them in that. And double taxation of the families, I say, is who are already living in poverty is inhumane. They only want to give their loved ones hope and a chance. Um, and um, President Biden said in his inaugural speech that we need to get back to the truth. That is why I am urging you once again to stop transcriptions of meetings and, I didn't get to say earlier, transfer everything from recorded audios, videos, and or Zoom or future technology. We can be leaders in this practice and much safer mentally and physically for everybody so that the truth gets out there. Um, Thank you, Caller. I don't know. Thank you, Caller. Your two minutes are up. If you'd like, please contact the DOC or the BOPC at BOPC at doc.nv.gov. Anyone you else? Very much. We have no one else at this time, sir. Okay, last call. No one else? Okay. Thank you for attending. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Governor, if you would, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, allow me just to uh, reiterate something. First off, uh, I want to be clear what we have not done today because we heard some comment about um, OML and not people not seeing the draft of the AR. We have not today, my motion was not to adopt an AR. It was to, uh, we have directed the Department of Corrections to come back with us with this draft per our instruction. I contemplate that they're going to be doing a temporary regulation pursuant to what we've said to effectuate uh, that in the meantime, but uh, let's be clear that under OML, uh, we have not violated it because we have not voted on an AR in particular. I do want to have uh, my DAG chime in to the extent he thinks we need some clarifying language, um, uh, but I want to say that for the record because I heard a lot of folks reference not being able to see a red line or whatnot. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, AG Ford, Randall Gilmer, Chief Deputy Attorney General, representing the Department of Corrections. Uh, I agree, AG Ford, your motion was not to pass any particular AR-258. And in my previous comments, when I was speaking to, uh, in response to Governor Sislak's question about the retroactivity, I think I, I indicated in there that we will prepare a temporary regulation based upon uh, the board's approval today of the 50% number. Uh, that temporary regulation will probably be uh, in effect even today or by the end of this week, certainly. And then we will have the permanent AR prepared and posted pursuant to OML so that it can be voted and approved based upon the board's indication of, of agreement with the 50% number at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Anything else? General Ford or Secretary Sagaski? No, thank you, sir. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.